Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark, at chapter 10, and I'm going to start reading it at verse 46, and this is what it says. And they came to Jericho, and as he was going out from Jer the he that's being spoken of here is Jesus. And as he was going out from Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to, to be quiet. But he began crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And they called the blind man and said to him, take courage, arise, he is calling for you. And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and began following him on the road. Pray with me. Lord, you're here in this place. May we never take your presence for granted, but may we be transformed by your presence. This day, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, I read a story that is about Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus. This story, a lot of folks don't realize, there are very few stories in the Bible where Jesus does a healing and we know the name of the person. And it doesn't just give the name of the person. It also gives who his, his father is, knew his, knew his family. And this story was so important to the early church, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's pretty rare. That's very rare. It's a story where Bartimaeus, a blind man, is a beggar. And here uh, at the gate of Jericho, he sets out his, his, his cloak every day. Now, in verse 47 mentions his cloak, excuse me, verse 50 mentions his cloak. And that's not a throwaway piece of information right there. Chances were good that the cloak was the only thing that he had. The cloak was what would mark off his territory as a beggar. And when crowds came by Jericho the oldest city in the world he would beg and maybe they'd throw him a little bread or maybe if he was very fortunate a coin he was doing the best he could to scratch out an existence not a living an existence with a piece of bread and if he was really fortunate a coin that might might be able to afford him a little something to go along with the piece of bread that he got that day Day in and day out, he was on the very bottom of the rung. Leper maybe was the only one that was below him. He was a part of what was called the Amhaharats all through the New Testament. The people of the land. 
And when you live in a land where there are pastures everywhere, well, you really don't have to draw a picture to know what it means to be the people of the land. It's what's left behind in the pastures. These were the lowest of the low. And he's there with his cloak. And the cloak was so important that the law said that that if a, a very poor person gave you his cloak as collateral, that the person who received the cloak as collateral had to return it at night. This was his home. It wasn't just a, a place for him to, to scratch at. This was his home. This, he slept on the street, and this was his, his only roof, his only cover. He's there at the gate of the city, and Jesus comes with a multitude. Now, whenever the Bible talks about multitudes, we're not talking tens and twenties. Most often, when we talk about a multitude, we're talking about thousands that followed Jesus. He knew something was different. And maybe this might be an opportunity with thousands that he might get more than one piece of bread that day, enough for tomorrow as well. Maybe he might get, with thousands, he might get more than just a coin. He, he might get might get enough for more than just today and maybe enough for a week. And when he cries out, he doesn't call for bread. He doesn't cry for coin. He cries for mercy. He cries for mercy, and people try and shut him up. This is the the, the rabbi that thousands are following. You think he's going to pay attention to, to the people of the land? And he cries all the louder. And that's when Jesus hears and responds the cry, to the cry, to the cry for mercy. If ever there's a time that folks can understand a cry for mercy, I think now might be that time. And Jesus responds to that cry for mercy and calls to him. And what does Bartimaeus do? Tells us in verse 50, he cast aside his cloak. The only roof he had, the only space he had for a blind man to be able to reach out and and take that way, he cast it aside. He threw it off, he jumped up, and he went to Jesus. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, receive my my, my sight. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. And the very last words of this story are, and he began following him on the road. It's a story. It's a story of listening. It's a story of responding in faith, and it's a story of following. That's why it meant something to the early church. This was a story they could tell to one another. This is a story they could repeat again and again and again to remind folks to listen, to remind folks to respond in faith to lean on, to rely on, to trust in Jesus, and to follow. And we hear this story today, and we think, well, gosh, it starts off with such horrible, bad news. The lowest of the low, the people of the land, one of them sitting there by by the road, blind, scratching out a living. But it's in the interruption that Bartimaeus receives not bad news, but good news. It's in the interruption, in the time that that things seem darkest, that things seem lowest, that now, now is the best time to take advantage of the interruption. Now is the best time to listen. Now is the best time to respond in faith. Now is the best time to follow. And now is the time that, that, that what's natural on the inside says, let's circle the wagons. Danger's out there. Now is the time that what's natural on the inside. We're called to something more by His Spirit, to not what's natural, but beyond ourselves. That in this interruption, in this hard and difficult time, 
We're called to respond to Jesus, not the difficult time. Now, now is the best time to listen, to respond, and to follow, to take advantage of the interruption. A lot of stories about the Taj Mahal. And uh, one of the stories I like best is a story that Max Lucado tells, that the Taj Mahal was built in the 1600s by the Shah Jahan. It's been called the most beautiful building in the world, and that's what Taj Mahal means, most beautiful building. Well, the Shah Jahan had been building beautiful things from the time he was 16. And at this time, he wanted to, this to be his crown jewel the most beautiful building in the world, and it was built to honor his favorite wife. She had died, and it was built as a mausoleum. A lot of folks don't know that. It was built as a mausoleum for his favorite wife. And I understand he had to buy four or five palaces and all the land that surrounded them in order to have the the best land, the most beautiful land, to put the most beautiful building. And right in the center of that parcel, he placed the coffin of his wife. So all the workers, as they worked on this most beautiful building, they would be able to look and see to whom they were working. Well, as the story goes, as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, he was crossing the, the work site and his leg brushed up against something. Not knowing what it was, he dusted off his leg, and he called for the workers to dispose of the box, not realizing he had asked them to dispose of the remains of his his wife. So often it is, the days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, and you and I get distracted by the noise. We get distracted Sometimes by the suffering, sometimes by the busyness, sometimes by the the, the stuff out there. And we miss Jesus calling to us right here, right now, this day. I don't want us to confuse in this story that Jesus is passive. Jesus is nudging you and me every day. Sometimes he shakes us and sometimes he just plain old thumps us on the head. This is a time, a time of interruption, a time to take advantage of the interruption, a time to listen, a time to respond in faith, and a time to follow. Now is the best time, the best time to listen. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus' desire is to dine with you, to spend time with you, not for a quick drive through Not a quick brush by where we can dust it off quickly. But a time to sit, to respond, to hear your cry. And for you and me to listen to his voice. To listen to his voice and to follow. But I know just like you do, there are voices out there. There are voices out there that are calling to us, and that's the most natural thing in the world. But Jesus calls us to more than what's natural. He calls us to the power of His Holy Spirit, what's supernatural. I remember when I was in college, I would go with some friends sometimes to a church, hear a pastor preach that he was a great communicator. I think that's why we liked going there. And one of the things I noticed that when I heard him preach just about every Sunday, he would set up this straw man, and that, that was who we were against. And, and it was a, a us against the straw man, and every Sunday he'd shoot down the straw man, and, and we were feeling good because that's who we were not. And in my journal, I wrote down, some people are made strong by the enemies they fight. And, you know, most days I don't know what I think until I see what I say. 
And I'm so thankful to God that I wrote that down because over the years I've, I've gone back and, and that I, I wrote it in my journal. Some people are made strong by the enemies they fight. And I began to notice that because I wrote it down. I began to notice it all around me that my, my father's generation, they knew who the enemy was. They wore uniforms. And people gathered together close, in close-knit groups to fight the Nazis, to fight Hitler. The way my father put it is if we didn't join together fight, we'd all end up speaking German. And it was true. And so as a country, we joined together because we had a common enemy. And we saw ourselves as strong. And after World War II, we had a common enemy. The Soviet Union, they put missiles on Cuba, and those missiles weren't pointed just somewhere. They were pointed, Dobbins, Lockheed, and the Naval Air Station. It was the trifecta right here. Oh, when I was a kid, we'd do the duck and cover. Friends had bomb shelters. We knew who the enemy was. Life was clear. We really didn't have to look at ourselves too, too awful close because we had an enemy that, well, we felt a little vindicated by it because we knew who the enemy was. As long as that's who we were against, life was clear. And it seems like since the fall of the Soviet Union, as a country, we've been looking for an enemy. We've been looking across one aisle to the other. And leaders have even used that in the church to, to make us and them their allies and their enemies. Wh whose side are you on? And as long as there's an enemy, we don't have to look at us. As long as there's a voice that, that keeps us out there looking at, at the enemy, we look pretty good as long as the enemy is bad enough. And we're at a place, the same place we've always been. Voices calling to us to, to look and fight the enemy. And at the risk of sounding like Captain Obvious, Jesus said, love your enemies. That's not natural. He's calling us beyond what you and I can do today or ever. We can't do it without the power of His Spirit inside of you and me. The Apostle Paul knew what it was like to have people after him. People had deserted him. He was beaten with rods. He was beaten with whips. He was thrown into prison. And from prison, from prison, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, this is what he says. Whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Jesus Christ is worthy of, of, of your praise and mine for what He did on the cross for you and for me. He, he did what our enemies couldn't do. He took your sin and mine. And he wiped it away. No matter how bad our enemies are, our enemies cannot wipe away our sin. Our enemies cannot cleanse us. Jesus is worthy of your praise and mine. We have a Savior who's worthy of our praise. He rose on the third day. For you and me to give power we don't have. Not just power up in heaven. It's power to live in your life and mine. The power of the risen Christ. The power of His Spirit. That we might love our enemies. 
and look to Jesus who's worthy of our praise. And we might sing that praise to him. We might keep our eyes and our praise on him. That we might listen. That we might respond in faith. And we might follow. This morning, I've got a simple invitation. But simple doesn't mean easy. It's an invitation to prayer and fasting for the next three days. Find a meal and fast that meal. Go without that meal. And one of the things you'll find when you go without food, you'll find out what makes you grumpy. You'll find it out real quick. You'll find out what you've been insulating yourselves from. And you've got something immediately to pray about. Use the time in fasting, the one meal, to pray. To pray. To listen. Not just talk, but to listen. Use the time in the fasting to respond in faith. How is Jesus calling you beyond yourself? Not just to me and mine, not just to circle the wagons and and what can I do to help me, but to respond in faith, to reach out to a world that needs to know who Jesus is. And how is Jesus calling you to follow God's still in control, even when it seems like the world's not. God's still in control. His name is Jesus, and He's he's my Savior and yours. He'll speak to you in ways that I can't, that even the worst enemy can't. He'll speak to you in ways that'll It'll transform your life. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, you are worthy, worthy of our praise. And may a time of of change now, now be the best time to take advantage of the interruption. Now be the best time to listen, to respond in faith. And to follow. Lord, for a lot of folks, to pray and fast has never been a, anything that they've done before. Well, these, we're in times like many of us have never experienced before. Lord, Lord, in this time, may we hear we listen grant power enough to respond power enough to follow breathe on us breath of God that we might know your power it might not just be a word in the Bible word for somebody else but we might know that resurrection power alive in us I'm very thankful for your spirit your spirit moving in the lives of people here in this church. I'm thankful for the power of your spirit moving in the prayers of the people here in this church. Lord, I'm thankful for what you have done. And Lord, I'm thankful for what you will do. That you might move out, move, move with the power of your spirit a power that we've never seen before out from this place. And the world begins to change through us. Not somebody else, but through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock.
and 1115 AM. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at RUMC.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at RUMC.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at RUMC.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>